Hello and welcome to another episode of Bare Bones Wargaming, a show with no bells, no whistles, no frills, just a man, a camera, and his game. This episode, we are heading to pre-World War II Europe, taking a look at Triumph and Tragedy, the European Balance of Power, 1936 to 45, designed by Craig Biscay, Bis Biskeen, Bisqueen. I'm sorry. Hope I don't do too bad with his um, last name there. Um, so, <laughs> time and tragedy. I'm sorry. As a former history teacher, I just can't help but chuckle at you know <clears throat> the depiction of Poland and Ukraine in this 1936 cover. Um, yeah, that's always made me chuckle a little bit. All right, now this video is basically going to be about my solo variant I've done. Now, just a few things first. Um, with my solo variant, uh, this is nothing that I'm looking to set the world on fire. This is not like some great stroke of genius. What my solo variant is designed for is basically to make some uncertainty and make each game a little different if you're playing by yourself. And as you all know, I play solo most of the time, especially my war games. I play them almost all solo. So a three-player game, of course, provide some challenges playing solo and that's why I designed this fairly simple method um, to do that with so again there's nothing shattering here you know I'm not gonna be like Tom Hanks in Castaway yes I have created fire no we're not getting too carried away with that but what I have created I think is something that keeps things unbalanced and different but it also is challenging because I've used the solo method now a couple of times uh, more than a couple of times I've didn't mean that literally probably like four or five times and I have won only I think once as my faction the faction I play actively I play one faction actively I let my solo method play the other two factions and then kind of take it from there now just a quick thing here about the faction that um the factions and the solo rules and stuff that I'm doing here these are basically designed to be used at the beginning of the game basically to give each country a national character if you will or to create and craft a strategic um, uh, narrative so that then eventually after 1937 you know when you do play the countries um, you can go ahead and by then you should see which way they're leaning are they heavily going towards military stuff are they heavily going towards investment and you can go ahead and kind of either balance things or you can continue to run with whatever they're doing that's kind of up to you but by 38 it's pretty clear what the strategy is that has developed by that point for each country and again yeah some of these things may seem off the wall but you know the hitler ribbentrop thing was off the wall saddam hussein the wacky Iraqi invading Kuwait was off the wall. I mean, history's full of stuff that just, you know, those moments of Scooby-Doo moments, as I like to call them, Reggie, where, you know, it makes no sense whatsoever. So, anyway. So, keeping that in mind, um, again, I'm not going to, this is, video is not going to be super detailed about the rules. I'm going to assume that most of you have played this game and you're just kind of curious about my solo variant uh, at this point. Okay, so here we go. I've already started the production um, phase for uh, 1936. I've already taken care of that. So I did the piece dividends. I figured out the turn order. And that's one thing that makes this game solo friendly is every single turn you have a different turn order. So you never know who's going to have to go first. Okay. So my solo variant is the emphasis is really on the production phase, as you can see. There, okay. So after you determine the production value, which is the lowest one of the three, not including resources when your country is at peace. You don't count that, of course, per the rules. Um, then you roll a number of d6 equal to that value. Okay. So like, for example, you know, the West has to go first here in 1936. So their lowest thing is their industry at seven. So I rolled seven dice for them. And using my little table here, we're going to see what they're going to do. Okay. And again, I'm, I'm not pretending that this is genius. I'm not pretending that this is all oh, the greatest things in sliced bread, but it's just a way to have an unbalanced game an interesting game um, that, it's, again, so far, I have not been super lopsided. You know, it's not like me as the player being able to crush the quote-unquote AI. That hasn't happened yet, okay? So every one or four is military planning. So basically, you're either going to be building new cadres or you're going to be increasing blocks that exist, okay? Two to five is purchase an action card. 
which of course are the ones that you can use for diplomacy or to move units in turn, and then purchase an investment card as a three or a six. And as it says here, sorry, for the military planning, if you do get military planning, then you roll another die, and if it's odd, you build a new cadre of your choice, or you improve an existing cadre of your choice. Now, of course, if you really wish to have a lot of uncertainty, you can assign die rolls, you know, like if you got air, naval, units that can be built, or, you know, those ones that are, exist on the map, you could arbitrarily just decide which ones get improved, etc., etc. Okay, so you can do that. So again, you know, like I said, there's nothing super fancy here. There's nothing big, but I figured I'd put that up on the screen for those of you who might be interested in this, and you can pause, take a look at it and stuff. So, let's get rolling. So the Western Faction, I rolled their seven dice already. So let's go up here and zoom in on them. All right, so they have rolled a four, two fives, and a bunch of sixes. Okay, so they rolled the four, so now we need to find out what are they going to do? Their military planning. And their follow-up roll is an even one. So even, they're going to improve an existing unit of their choice. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead, and now of course it has to be in the home country. Um, I'm sorry, it can be elsewhere, but you can't build new units except in the home country. That's what I meant to say. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to kind of do this, I think, because I was gun-shy. Last game I had, the Soviets drove into India hard. They, they almost won the game that way. So I'm going to go ahead, since everything's open, all supply lines and everything and stuff, I'm going to go ahead and improve the one unit here in Karachi as a buffer for that one. Okay, so that takes care of the four. So two fives means that they will get two extra action cards. And of course, you don't have to worry about how many cards each faction gets because you only have to worry about hand size at the end of the government phase. After we're done playing all these cards for diplomacy and then deciding should we hold on to some of these things. Okay? And then they're also getting four investment cards. Okay? Now, since the Western Allies' hand size is not the biggest in the world, um, they're going to need to be careful with this. But again, they'll be able to maybe use some of those cards. Okay. So there's the Western Allies. They are all set up using their dice. Okay. Now, I'm actively playing the Axis faction here. Uh, mostly because I find in games that I play solo against an AI or some kind of solitaire system I've designed, it just makes it more interesting if I play the more aggressive ones here. Okay. All right, so my lowest one is actually my population here. It's 11. So I can go ahead and I have 11 production points to spend to do stuff with. Okay. Now, early on in games, I have to admit, I'm, I'm a big diplomacy person. I'm, I'm big on geopolitics. But, of course, the Axis already starts with 14 cards. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend some of those 11 improving some units. Okay. So let's go ahead and... Let's go one. Now, you can only improve each unit one step in this game, um, if you don't know the rules to that. So we'll go one, two, three, four. Uh, let's keep an eye on France. Five. And then, let's see, I've got six left. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to buy, with my six, I'm going to buy four investment cards. And then I will also pick up two more action cards. Because, again, I like to do a lot of diplomacy at the beginning of the game. Okay, so now that takes us over to the Soviet Union. Now, Soviet Union, is the lowest one is nine. So it will be nine dice to roll for USSR. So let's see what happens there. So we'll start with five. Okay. So here in the Soviet Union... We'll line up all the die rolls here, so they'll have nine production points that they can spend. So I didn't mean to sound like Ed Rooney there. Nine times. And then we need four more yet. So let me grab four more. Let's see what we get. Whoa, interesting. Okay. Kind of, um... Everybody's kind of doing their own thing here. This is interesting. So the Soviets, I'll zoom in here for, for you for a second here. The Soviet Union, let me move you. The Soviets 
have rolled a lot of military stuff, so you could look for them to get aggressive here. That could be interesting. Maybe it's a good thing I did build up that unit there. So they've got five military things they're going to do with their production point. Two more action cards and two investment cards. So now we've got to roll five more dice and find out what we're going to get here. Okay, so we rolled two odds and three evens. Now again, by that second chart, that means that the odds, we're going to build a new cadre of the choice. And then of course, stick it in the home country. Now as the Russians building new stuff, of course I'm inclined to build um, tanks and infantry. So that's what we'll do. We'll build the new guys. That's two there. And then we're going to improve three existing blocks. So, let's see. So let me back up here a little bit. Which one should I improve? Well, I'll tell you what. Let's go one, two, whoops, and three. Just to kind of give options there. Okay. And then I'm going to go ahead and place my two new units. I'll place the one infantry in Kiev, and I'm going to build up a nice big strong armor unit here in Kharkov. All right, so that's the Soviet option there with their military. And they're going to get two more action cards. Take them up to a total of eight for the time being. And one thing I like to do, especially with the whole... Um, you know, you can pass and stuff. And since I know, of course, the Germans have a lot of cards, um, I put a die on top. I'll come out here a little bit. I put a die on top of the decks. Like you can see the eight-sided die there um, for the Soviets, just to kind of go ahead and, you know, remind myself how many they have so that they can pass um, as they go. And then, of course, they're also going to buy two more investment cards. Now, given the fact that their hand size is only six, they're really going to have to be using up most of these cards. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Okay. So let's go ahead and execute things here and we'll see how this goes with the game. Now the turn order is the West, the Axis, Fascism, and then of course Communism. Okay, now of course I'm actively playing the Axis, so I'm going to take a look here and see what I've got for cards and see what I want to do here. Oh my goodness, there's a lot of cards here. Let me just take a quick perusal. Hmm, well that's interesting. Oh, I might have to do that. Huh. Now, I'll tell you what I'm seeing here right now. I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing a lot of Czechoslovakia cards in my hand. So I'm thinking about trying to get Czechoslovakia as a satellite and secure, um, secure my flank there. Which, of course, would be very um, Germanish of me, so to speak. Um, yeah, okay. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to go ahead and play one of the Czechoslovakian cards. Now, of course, if you don't know Triumph and Tragedy, what basically happens is that you go ahead and you play all the cards down and you keep going, and as people go, you cancel cards out. So, like, if the West or the Soviets put down a Czechoslovakia card, they'll cancel mine out. Once everybody's played all their cards, then you'll be able to go ahead and, after that, you'll be able to go ahead and, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. You'll be able to go ahead and... <laughs> I must be really tired. You'll be able to go ahead and then place stuff at the end if you're the only one uh, that is left at that point. Okay? So. Alright, so I'm going to play that Czechoslovakia card. Now, of course, as the Germans, I still have a ton of cards. So, of course, the Soviets will pass, the West will pass, and I'll need to play another one here. So, let me take a look at my investment cards, what I've got. Oh, I've got the Precision Bomb Site. i got two of those. Ooh, that's tempting. Um, yeah, I've got I got two precision bomb types. I got atomic research level number one. I've got industrial and espionage. Um, boy, that precision bomb site. I can attack industry. Boy, that would that may be worth it. 
Ooh, or of course I can total up these numbers to my um, industry production, which is a five, and increase my industry production by one. But you know what? I'm going to go ahead and play these two together and pair them up, and I'm going to go with the bomb site. Okay. So again, Soviets and West will pass. So let me see here. Um, yeah, I'm going to go whole hog on Czechoslovakia. I'm going to play a second Czechoslovakia card. All right. Okay, they'll pass again because I still have gobs of cards here. And let's see. I'm going to hold on to that for the time being, I think. Let's see. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and play this because this card, these wild cards are instant. It says add one friendly or remove one rival influence marker in any neutral nation adjacent to a friendly controlled territory. So since I'm after Czechoslovakia, that makes sense for me to just go ahead and place one of them suckers down now in Czechoslovakia. Now those cards don't have to wait till the end of the, the government phase. Okay? Alright, so they have 8, they have 10. Well, technically they have... 14 and they have 10. I've still got 15. Okay, so we're going to have to stop passing here in a minute and then we'll see what happens with that. Okay. Alright, um, let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. But I got a couple of turkey cards here too. That would be, that would be kind of good for me also. Um, hmm. Alright, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to slap down one turkey card. Let me see what I can do with that. Okay. Alright, so now I'm down to 14 cards. So the Soviets will pass because they're at 10. But the Allies now will go ahead and execute. Now, as part of this solo method, too, I basically just do odd and even with action cards and investment cards. So on roll. Investment. Now, of course, naturally that means you're going to see what they have and stuff like that. But, I mean, you know, that's just kind of all, you know, it's, there's limitations with any game playing solo. But especially um, ones that um, have cards. So, you know. Okay, let me look at here. Let's see. It's just 1938 technology. But you know what? The industry is lagging. But I need a total of... Six. Let's see if I have six. Oh, I don't. Two, three, five. I only have five. Whew. Well. All right, well, you know what? Since this is the West, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pair these two up and give them their sonar. So now they will have sonar, which will be important for them, of course, with the U-boat menace that will be to come. Okay. All right, let's see now. Let's see, I've got a few other options here too. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead, just for the purposes of this video, to keep things rolling. I'm going to go ahead and lay down a second turkey card here. And let's see what happens. Now, the Soviets will still skip the Western faction, of course. We'll go ahead now. This time, they're going to play an action card. So what I do with the action cards is I just flip them up one at a time. And to make a choice on either using them for diplomacy or saving them for the future for actions. Okay, well, see, now this one has Czechoslovakia. So if I'm the West and I see already these two Czechoslovakia cards down, I'm going to go ahead and play it, which is going to cancel out the Axis Czechoslovakia card. So that's that. No dice. Okay, I don't think I have another Czechoslovakia card. Oh, well, you know what? I'm a liar. Look at that. Boom! Go ahead, try to kick me out. Stalin says, yet. No need to play yet. All right, fine. So let's see what the West is going to do with their new action card. Hmm. They've got Hungary and Yugoslavia. Ooh, Hungary would put things on the doorstep. Yugoslavia would be nice, too. So you know what? They're going to go ahead and play Yugoslavia and play that down there. Okay. All right. Now, Stalin decides he's going to finally get in the game here. And get active. And again, I mean, you can keep going if you want to. I'm going to do this for the purpose of the video just to keep things moving and kind of interesting here. So they're going to go ahead and look at their two investment cards. Um, well, look at that. Oh, this is going to be an interesting game. The Soviets are already ready to prop, 
are already parrying rocket artillery. So look at that. Infantry has first fire. All right. Ooh, that will definitely be helpful. Now, remember, they build a bunch of military blocks. So um, that will be interesting. All right. Back to the West. So we'll flip the West action card. Uh, let's see. So we can add one friendly influence marker in any neutral nation adjacent to rival controlled territory. I got. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do Poland. I mean, you know, I know that's very World War II-ish, for lack of a better way to articulate. But I'm gonna slap that sucker in Poland, and start to cause problems. Okay. And if you don't know triumph and tragedy, the more markers that go down in a country, the more the possibility increases that um, you won't be able to attack without declaring war on people and causing um, a ruckus, so to speak. All right. Just taking a look here at my special cards again, because I've got a couple of wild cards. I just don't know what to do with them just yet because um, I can add if I want I can remove um, hmm. I can also do that I can do that too interesting all right you know what actually I'm gonna do this fear and loathing one because fear and loathing says that you can remove a nation's influence from a listed neutral country um, so the axis, hmm, remove a list of factions, listed neutral nation. So, so if I'm the axis, wait, hold on, make sure I'm reading this right. Remove a listed factions influence marker. So from the axis, I'd be able to do that. Oh, so from the west, it would have to be it. Poland's not on that list. Okay, never mind. I'm not going to use that then. You don't want to do though. I'm going to try and keep the pesky USA out of the war as long as possible. That's what I typically do. All right. Let's see what Stalin's up to now with his diplomacy and or actions. Oh, wow. This is really a no-brainer geopolitically. Nobody has Finland on the table yet. Interesting. Okay, back to the west. Ooh, look at that. The West has Yugoslavia and Romania. So you know what? I'm going to go ahead and try to double down there. Do I have a Yugoslavia card? If I do, I better get it on the table and get rid of that. Um, I see Yugoslavia is not listed there. That's adding. That's 4 and 8. Shoot. I don't think I have a Yugoslavia. All right, you know what? You know what? Western powers, two can play at this game. I want to put down a low country card. I'm going to try and get in Britain's front yard. All right. The Soviets. Huh. Well, this is an interesting quandary for the Soviets. Should I save this for a command card? But getting Austria would make the Germans nervous. But getting Latin America with those resources would be really good for them. You know what? I'm going to go for the resources. But the whole point is to spread communism around the world, right? So why not go ahead and get as many inroads as you can? Oh, well... Hmm, now this is interesting too, because for the West, I could do Latin America and cancel the Soviet card, or I could play Greece and start to put some influence there next to Yugoslavia, building a nice big wall that could either turn towards the fascists or turn towards the communists. You know what? I'm going to do that. Okay, I can't have this happening as the Germans. So I'm going to go ahead and play my Greece card. And Greece is the word, and that cancels out their card. Okay. All right, Stalin, what's he up to? Oh, well, well, well. Well, actually, this is a tougher choice because there's the Baltic states, but they have no resources. Might be better to have them as a buffer if you're going to start invading Scandinavia. And getting Finland could be the first step to being really active over there. All right, let's see what happens. Oh, well, this is a bummer. Czechoslovakia, they could also get Spain, though. But I think it's smart for them to try and block... Czechoslovakia, because otherwise we're going to get a satellite pretty quick. Okay, so they block Czechoslovakia. All right. Let's see. Well, hmm. you know, I'm going to keep going after the low countries. I'm going to put a second one down on the low countries. Oh, this is interesting. So Stalin could do Greece, but he also could double down really on Latin America. 
I don't know what kind of use that would be militarily, though. But it would nail down those resources. But once war breaks out... Now, you know what? They'll play it for Greece. Yeah, they'll try and keep them away from that foothold there. Alright, well, the Allies... Notice here I'm not using a whole lot of cards for movement, because basically, in my opinion anyway, in 1936, you really should be looking at diplomacy and trying to shore things up there. So they're going to go ahead with their Southeast Europe campaign and play it for Bulgaria. All right. Well, if that's what they're going to do, then I'm going to play this Hungry card and try to secure my flank down there. So it's... Ooh. They're going to play the Sweden card. I mean, hey, why not start marching across Scandinavia, right? Somebody better do something about that. Oh. Third Yugoslavia card. Oh, come on, man. I don't have one. Don't let me do that. I can't do anything about this. Mm -mm, I can't. I don't have anything. Oh, this is going to make for a very bizarre game. Alright, fine. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and try to secure the Hungarians then. Get them on my side here early on in the conflict. Alright. Stalin. Oh, Stalin pulled a wild card. Ooh, this is interesting. So Stalin could throw a monkey wrench in the plans there because he can add one friendly or remove one rival influence marker in a listed neutral nation. And the only one for the Soviets is Yugoslavia. So I either need to do that or I need to save it. You know what? I'm going to play it. Because if I'm really playing these factions independently, that's got to make the Soviets nervous that the Western faction is getting such a stack down there in Yugoslavia. So they won't be able to make it into a satellite this turn. That just won't happen. Nope. Can't happen. All right. Western faction. You know, at this point, they're going to pass. they got two cards left. I've got four. I'm going to play this other USA card. Well, actually, nobody's played a Romania card. And Romania's got a lot of resources. I'm going to play my the Romanian end of that card. All right, Stalin will pass. He's only got one card. They got two. They'll pass. Uh, let me see. What am I going to do? I'll be honest. I have a tendency to play almost all the cards in 36 if I can. Um, let me see. Um, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and play this foreign aid wild card. Because this will let me reduce my industry by one. So I'm going to drop my industry back down to 11. But then I can put an influence marker in any neutral nation. And countries are basically neutral um, until they become a satellite. So you know where I'm going. I'm going to Czechoslovakia. Go in my front yard. See if I can secure that flank. All right, Stalin will skip. The West now, of course, is going to have to go. They've not no choice. Ooh, you know what? They don't want to delay the USA too long, so they're going to play the USA card to cancel out our USA card. Okay. All right, Stalin will skip. Or it's my turn, so I have to decide if I'm going to pass. Hang on to these. Hmm, there's not too many ones down here yet, unfortunately. So I really can't use that fear and loathing. The ties that bind. Oh, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and do the ties that bind, because I can add one to Hungary, and I'm after the Hungarians right now. Let me go ahead and do that. So I will add that to Hungary. Okay. So, Stalin now will play his last. Oh, Stalin had two cards left. What a wily, crafty character he is. Um, okay, Stalin's going to play this Greece card. Because Greece is the word. Okay, let's see what the West is going to do with their last card. Interesting, they have Turkey and Denmark. Let's see. Well, they see the Axis have two Turkey cards, so that's probably for the best to block over there as much as possible. 
because a, tur <laughs> a turkey that's a satellite of the axis would be very bad. I'm going to pass because the last card I have, I really can't use for anything right now. All right, and then Stalin. Stalin's last one is either Spain or Poland. But you know what? Since everything's at peace, it makes sense for him to play Spain. Why not? Okay, so to turn over here, let's go ahead and resolve this. Now, unfortunately for the West, they are not happy. Because while they did have three Yugoslavia cards, there's a Soviet marker there. So one of the cards will take the Soviet marker out, and they will get two into there, which is good, because now that will give them access to all the resources and all that stuff. Okay, Can't place units there and can't put supply through, but they'll get the resource. Okay, Now the resources are basically based on the symbols that are there. So there's one resource... And then there's no population value, though, in Yugoslavia. But it does give them another resource. And, of course, resources will count when war breaks out. All right. And then, of course, they also have this one into Bulgaria as well. And, again, according to the chart, that means that with Bulgaria, they will get the population and the resources there. So again, there's another resource there. Sophia's too small to offer any population, but again, more resources, so there it goes. Okay, so the West, geopolitically, is closing in on things. Oh, and I almost forgot Poland. They also have Poland up here, too. Forgot about their one marker there. So they'll go ahead and let's see. Now, Poland, there's quite a bit going on here. Poland, let's do the resources first. So that's one resource. Population-wise, let's see. Warsaw yields a 1. And the Vow yields a 1. So that's going to give them two more population. So the West really needs to be focusing on their industry, investment-wise, trying to catch up with their other resources. So not too bad. They're very active in Eastern Europe, this opening turn. Okay, Axis. Now, I can put one influence marker in Romania, which is good, because that will give me access, at least temporarily. I'll have access to two resources. That nice oil, one, two. And then, of course, uh, Bucharest will give me one population as well. So that's good. The Low Countries managed to get two influence markers into the Low Countries, which will come in handy if I can get them as a satellite when war breaks out with France, because of course it probably will. Not inevitably, but good chance of that. Okay, now in Amsterdam, the only thing I really have there is another population value, but that's okay. That takes me up by one. That's useful. Now, Czechoslovakia. I had two markers from other cards. I managed to keep one Czechoslovakian card on the map. So, boom! Czechoslovakia becomes a satellite. Whoa! That is something I've never seen before. Okay. Now, when that happens, when a country becomes a satellite, okay, then you can go ahead and deploy a combat unit with the muster value, which prog there, the muster value is 2. So I can deploy a friendly combat unit in that spot. So let me just make sure here, um, for sure, with that. But I'm almost 100% sure. I haven't played this for a little while. So I'm just checking here in the rules when it comes to satellites. Uh, just bear with me for one second. <laughs> yeah, place units of that faction's great power. In minor cities and towns according to the muster value. Well, in Czechoslovakia, there's only one. But that's great, because now I can put, and I will put, a two-strength infantry into Czechoslovakia. Awesome. And that's like that's like a dream come true. So I do have one card in Turkey, remember? So I will put an influence marker into Turkey. Turkey will yield quite a bit of benefits resources-wise. So Turkey will yield, let's see, well, they'll yield one natural resource. And then Istanbul and Ankara will both yield two population. So that's awesome. And then I had two cards for Hungary. So two markers go into Hungary, which puts them basically as a borderline 
Uh, well, actually, I already had one in Hungary. I forgot about that one in Hungary. So Hungary now is a German satellite. That's awesome. So I get the one resource. I get the one population. And I get to put another unit with a strength value. The muster for Budapest is two. I'm going to put another infantry unit down. Ooh. Well, this is shaping up to be interesting. Good thing, actually, that the Allies probably put all that stuff into southeastern Europe the way they did. I have to say, this is the first time I've ever had a game like this where they're not really canceling each other out. You know, the cards came out odd without any canceling abilities. That's they're very limited, I guess I should say. All right, over to the Soviets. So we'll start in Spain. All right. So they now have influence in Spain, which will give them two more population. So the Soviets will get that. They will now make Greece into a protectorate, which really is going to make a huge collision course down here in southeastern Europe. And that will give them another resource, because Athens has a resource, but that's it. Okay. Latin America, for the time being, until war breaks out, supply lines are cut off. But hey, until then, they can claim two natural resources from that area. Although, of course, it's only really good for war, so maybe we should use that for something else. But they're also going to get two influence markers into Finland. Which is important because now they're looking at eyeing up Scandinavia. And that's another resource up there at Petsamo. And then last but not least, the Soviets will get one influence marker into Sweden. Which will give them two more resources. And will give them one more population value. Okay, so clearly everybody, everybody next turn should really be thinking about the idea of investing in their industry. Yeah, investment markers are probably going to fly out of here, at least for me. Now, what the other factions will do will be determined by the die rolls that I have. Now, again, I didn't save any cards for any of the action phases um, for this, but typically I don't because typically I like to see how the diplomacy plays out and all that. And again, the way the diplomacy sets up with this solo variant goes a long way to determining what the rest of the game is going to play like. Now again, you know, if you're at this point looking at this being like, whew, there's some clearly defined strategies here and lines, then you can just abandon it. If you just want to use this, my little solo method to kind of set the table you know, and go into 1937 and then, you know, take control uh, of the factions for the most part. You can always do that, too, okay? Again, one of the things that's nice about this solo is the turn order, because the turn order is going to be determined each time, and you just never know which order it's going to go in. Um, so, again, you know, somebody who would move faster can be a big thing. You know, the fact that everybody got a technology here at the beginning, that's another weird thing I don't think I've ever seen before. You know, everybody got something good. The, the British got the the um, sonar, so now they're able to handle submarines more. So as the Axis, I'll have to think that think about that again. But I've got the precision bomb site, so now I might want to build my air force up some more and to like pound some things when it's time for war. And the Soviets have rocket artillery, which lets their their infantry fire first. That's going to be a huge advantage. So not surprisingly, you, you probably will foresee the the Russians building massive amounts of infantry here. Okay, and again, since I didn't save any action cards. Well, that's not entirely true, I guess. The Axis does have, if I wanted to, um, they could play their spring card. It only gives me four movements. I don't know if that's really worth doing that right now. But then again... Hmm... Because, see, I could march some of my units in Germany now into Czechoslovakia and Hungary. But I don't expect anything to happen anytime soon. Of course, now I'm on Romania's doorstep, so that's something to think about, too. Um, now, you know what? I'll save it. I won't I won't play it for the, the spring. So nothing going on with all those phases there. And now we'll be ready for 1937. And then I'll pick up from there. Again, uh, for me, I always do the first two turns with the dice randomly determining what... Um, how they're going to spend the resources for the two factions I don't play. And I play each faction, you know, I kind of rotate it around. But again, you know, I've only won once or twice in like five, six, seven plays, something around there, somewhere between five and seven plays I've done with this, okay?
So again, this is, you know, to stress again, I know some people are, are very much focused on uh, an AI being intelligent and all that kind of stuff and things. And what I'm just trying to do with this system is just create, you know, kind of, I guess you could say it's kind of creating a narrative for the rest of the game, especially if you only use it for the first turn. Because then you have all these things kind of lined up and organized and, and you have an idea of, um, you know, what's going to happen next turn. You know, now the Soviets have rocket artillery. Obviously, if you're actively playing the Soviets, you'd be thinking about building, you know, the infantry and also, you know, looking to see grease carts, spend grease carts down there. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of wide open. But again, I, I rarely use it beyond 1937 because by the end of 1937, you have a pretty good idea of what your strategy is going to be for each faction. So... So there you go. That's my solo method. Um, you know, um, for what it's worth, you know, your mileage may vary. If you want to use it or not, it's up to you. Let me know. Um, I'd be curious to see if anybody tries it out, see what you think of it and stuff. But um, as promised, I know some time ago <laughs> it's been a little while. But as promised, this is the solo method I have um, for this game. So there you are. Alright, so next video, I'm not sure where I'm going to go next, next video, because um, there's some things happening here, um, different things going on. Um, a little birdie has told me that for my birthday I might have some good stuff showing up. Um, another Barbarossa game, I know, right? Another one. <laughs> um, but also, potentially, supposedly, allegedly on the QT, um, Race to the Rhine. So... That could be interesting. I might take a look at that and see. Um, and I know there's like a solo method to play like one group. Because I was watching, um, or I read a session report about Race to Moscow, which I um, backed on Kickstarter and it's coming out next year sometime. Uh, there's a solo method. You do one army group, you know, kind of thing. But I'm sure if you mess around and tweak enough, you could probably play more, multiple without too much trouble. It's... There's got to be a way to, to make it work, or at least make it work enough with house rules that, you know, you have a good time. Because let's face it, in the end, that's the most important thing here is, are you having fun with it? Are you having a good time? And quite frankly, you know, I am. So, yeah, I know you probably think I should have built up those blocks in France, but, you know, as decision-making theory says, I guess to let the recency effect get a little too um, powerful in my thinking about what I did there before. So, all right. So there's that method. We'll see what shows up for my birthday here um, in a little bit. And we'll kind of work things from there. Uh, I may go back to Storms of Steel or I may even go to um, Awakening the Bear and do um, and do a scenario from that. Uh, I do need to look into the solo rules for Conflict of Heroes because I also have that as well. So that's where we're at here at this point here at the uh, Bare Bones Wargaming Headquarters. All right, so, uh, for those of you who live in the United States, wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving. Um, enjoy the time with your family and friends. Don't get swamped over on Black Friday. Um, myself, personally, I'll, I'll be watching football. So, you know, with at least one of my boys, maybe two. <laughs> who knows how that, will, how that will all play out. So, but, there you go. There's my solo method for Triumph and Tragedy. And just one other thing to mention, too, that I've done before. Um, sometimes I take the Dice of Decision um, me mechanics from Totler Krieg and get all that figured out, you know, like what's going on, factions, blah, 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 border shifts and stuff, and then I transfer it to this. And sometimes that makes for some wild games. Very wild games indeed. So, um, yeah. So again, you know, I'll be curious to see the the sister game that covers the Pacific is supposed to be coming out. My P five hundred that on GMT, but I'll be curious to see how that's going to work because part of the beauty of this game to me is the cards and the diplomacy method. That's what makes this so much fun. Um, I mean, there's not a whole lot of diplomacy to do in the Pacific, so that'll be kind of interesting to see how they're going to handle that. So, I mean, the geopolitical situation very different. All right, so this is Tim Korsler from Bare Bones Wargaming saying thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next time. Oh, I know what the other thing I was going to mention was Ostkrieg, um, the new um, 
Barbarossa Eastern Front game from Compass Games is supposed to be coming out in December too, which has a similar engine to uh, Pacific Tide, which of course I did several videos on when it came out earlier in 2019. So that hopefully will be showing up on the doorstep before too long too if it stays on schedule. And when I get a hold of that, I'll let you guys see it and uh, I'll also um, do a playthrough and stuff because, well, you, you guys know me. I can't say I can't say no to a, a Barbarossa game. Never, never, have never, I don't think I've ever turned down one. I've ditched some. Um, like that one, what is that one called? Something about the bear. In that um, group of four games, Four Roads to Moscow. I can't remember what uh, what that one's called, but that was a horrible game. Worst game on the Eastern Front I've ever played. I can't remember the full name of it. Because it's Hitler Turns East, Slaughterhouse, Code Word Barbarossa, and then there was this. Strike the Bear. Strike the Bear. That's what it's called. Yeah, Strike the Bear. But more appropriately, would be Put the Bear to Sleep. Okay, so Oskrieg also in the future as well. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.